have you checked the children? <laughs> days and pleasant nights fellow travelers along the path of beam i am known on this level of the tower as randall fuego and i am very stoked to be joined here by my cohorts in crime on the horror show none other than robert wolfman i'm cecil laird Dan Reese, and uh, i have had the blessing and the awesome opportunity courtesy of cecil of hosting you Game gotta you gotta stop King. the music or we're gonna get killed on youtube for okay. it <laughs> <laughs> But yes, I have had the awesome opportunity of uh, getting to host over 300 episodes of Hail to Stephen King, uh, dating back over six years at this particular point. And most recently, I got to uh, do another little pet project called Bakker at the Moon. Ha ha ha. That's right. And so I've been delving into the work of Clive Barker. And this panel is essentially, uh, since there are uh, a few awesome individuals in attendance, but this will be uh, living virtually on our YouTube channel, uh, the Horror Show channel. And uh, yes, it's going to be an interesting kind of comparison about who is the true master of modern horror, Clive Barker or Stephen King. Now we're going to be analyzing just how prolific both of them have been, but also how Clive has a little bit more of a niche as far as like just expanded creativity in comparison with King, despite the fact that King has published way more books in his years of creativity and whatnot. And so that's what uh, we are very much looking forward to kind of dissecting and having a little bit of discussion about. And so, uh, yes, thank you uh, to those in attendance and for those who are going to be watching this later on virtually. So uh, I guess uh, we were initially thinking that we were just going to jump into like personal experiences with each of these just creative like just dynamics and uh i will throw it over first and foremost for as far as like your first experiences with king to the founder of the feast as i all too often call him the showrunner on the horror show cecil my first experience with stephen king i believe reaching back as far as i can in my um age adult brain uh is I think It, the miniseries It, I saw that when I was a kid because it came out in 90, right? Yep, So that would have put yep. me at about um, 9 or 10 when I saw that and obviously Pennywise stuck in my mind ever since that point and I wasn't so attached to it that I actually love, love, love the new version of It and that version of Pennywise as well. So, um, but that first experience with It on the TV and then... Well, it, basically, my introduction to Stephen King was a lot of TV versions of his movies because I wasn't seeking out his movies in the theater. I was still too young, obviously, but that, and I remember the Langoliers really stuck with me from when I was younger, too. I loved the cheesy effects at the time because, to me, they didn't look cheesy at the time. I was like, ooh, cool, you know, rotating, floating mouths. So that's pretty neat. They have an age ball. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, true. yeah, that was my experience with Stephen King. Um, my introduction to Clive Barker... I believe was the Hellraiser franchise. Um, could have been Lord of Illusions though. Mm. I tried to determine which one I would have seen first, but I'm pretty sure it was Hellraiser because I was into horror by the time I got to Lord of Illusions and I know Hellraiser was a big part of that. But what's interesting to me is the dramatic difference between the two you know, creators. I mean, they, 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 they have such differences and I'm, I, I'm imagining we'll get into that. But yeah, those are my first experiences with them. Yeah. So my first experience, I would say, um, at least with Stephen King, would have to have been Cujo. And that was, I was probably, I was about maybe seven or eight, I think, when I first watched that. So, you know, it was a fun little, fun little movie for a kid to get, get into. Um, other than that... Did you have a dog? I did. I've always had dogs. <laughs> always had dogs. It's particularly fun. Yeah, yeah, it never bothered me. Um, also, I would say, again, going back to the miniseries of It, from 1990. Hell, I even still have the original VHSs from, from back in the day. Nice. Uh, but I more, more I would say is I have a more of a history with Barker over Stephen King, and that started with Raw Head Rex back in the day. Mm. And that was obviously with the VHS and then going into, it was years, years after um, even watching the movie that I started reading some of his books. And then I was like, kind of looking at him like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of see why I didn't start reading his stuff younger on because of how how much more graphic 
a little more and, depraved. Yeah, <laughs> a lot more graphic in the details than what what King ever does, especially on the sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I would always say uh, Barker. Barker has always been more of my favorite versus King. So good to go over you, Fuego. Yeah, man. I mean. Obviously, you know, King is my favorite author. I've done over 300 episodes of the Dan Hale Stephen King show, you know, and continue to forge forward and everything. But it's been very intriguing, like, finally getting into the works of Barker. I've been doing the Books of Blood most recently, and so I'm five volumes in. There's still one more that I have left to check out. And aside from Hellbound Heart and uh, Scarlet Gospels, I haven't really explored him from, like, a written standpoint. It's been more so, like, everything... Uh, on on screen, so mm -hmm. you know, like I was just rewatching Nightbreed last night, you know, in, in preparation for the panel, and I oh, still want that cabal cut that they keep, you know, teasing is, is going to come out at some particular point. So, uh, yeah, it's it's really with Barker more so of a, a visual sort of manifestation in, in comparison. And uh, the first thing that I ever saw from him, ironically enough, was there is a dual little anthology called Quicksilver Highway that had Christopher Lloyd in it. Hmm. And there is a, the, the second half of it, so it's, it's one King story and one Barker story. And the Barker story is about a bunch of hands that decide they're gonna rebel against the bodies of their owners and sever themselves and, and huh. like and have some sort of insurrection of insanity. The, the, the visual version was very cheesy. You know, I think I watched it on like Fox TV or something when I was a kid, but uh, yeah, so that was my first foray, even before Hellraiser, even before Midnight Meat Train, mm -hmm. and you know the the most recent Books of Blood, which was on Hulu. And so, yeah, uh, it, it was kind of a cheesy introduction and didn't really give as much of a vibe as insane and just very very sordid that Clive can be a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So, so well, yeah, it was like dipping my toe and not really understanding the full extent of what I was gonna. Yeah, expect, well, and especially so. too, even on like, we'll just to touch real quick on like, like their adaption stuff. Like mm -hmm. Barker, Barker's film adaptions versus King has still always been a lot more graphic and oh, yeah. brutal. Mm -hmm. So that that's again one thing that I've always appreciated more because he's also had a little bit more of a hand on his own work. Yeah, yeah, because he's directed multiple ones. Obviously, yep. he directed yep. Lord of Illusions. He directed, you know, the the first Hellraiser film and yep. co-wrote and produced the second one, Hellbound. And yep. so you know, he's had much more of like. I mean, King, really, he directed Maximum Overdrive, and he was like, I'm not really so into doing this. Maybe, you know, there was too much cocaine in my system or, you know, whatever it may have been at the time. But yeah, He was feeling he, froggy at the time. Yeah, yeah. But, I, I mean, it was a one and done with him, whereas Clive has shown that he has that visual sort of, you know, acumen to really do it and, and, and do it professionally and impressively. Mm -hmm. I think. As long as there's not an adverse amount of studio interference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, and, and I mean, as far as King goes, the first thing that I ever recall, like very distinctively watching, uh, like I, I have some like vague, you know, little glimmers of Pet Cemetery and uh, it, but it was really the Stand miniseries for me. That was the first thing that really just like kicked me in the face. And I think I was like maybe nine, 10, 11, whatever the hell it was at the time. I think it was 94, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, the Stan miniseries is still, you know, I'm, I'm dressed up here as like a half ass Randall flag for God's sake, you know? So um, yeah, that's, that's the one that really distinctively like hit with me. So, cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. So then as we, uh, so we've, we've covered kind of our origins and kind of our initial impressions of this, uh, but I guess the argument has to be made, who is more prolific as far as like a myriad of creativity? You know, because of the fact that King, you know, having only directed one film mm -hmm. and uh, written so much more than Barker, the argument that I really wanted to make was that I, I feel like Clive maybe is more talented as far as like, so well, more than I'm for, for, for. I mean, as far as like, you know, like, like an artistic multiple, and visual standpoint yeah. and everything, Clive definitely has that above King just because between the things that he's done with the uh, video game scripting, his, his, Jericho. Yeah, Jericho, um, his, his artworks, his, his toy line with uh, McFarlane toys and everything for his tortured soul line, like, things like that. Like, Barker definitely has that, that more, of a, more of a creative niche in artistry than I would say King does, especially with his own work. I would say also that it feels to me like fans of Barker's work appear to be more pleased with the adaptations of his work Absol than well, fans absolutely. of King's work tend to be. Well, and that's like, the thing, too. Is I don't know if that means it's harder to translate King or if 
Barker, since he's doing it himself, you know, he doesn't need to worry about someone tran mistranslating his work. Well, exactly. He's able to basically cherry pick and remove stuff that he knows is not going to work or translate easy enough on the film. Because mm -hmm. there's plenty of, plenty of Barker work, even like Weave World and things like that, that would be damn near almost impossible to bring to a visual standpoint perfectly onto a film. Mm -hmm. That's the tough thing, you know, is that uh, since there's so much less in, in the realm of Barker mm -hmm. to actually have the potential of adaptation, to, I mean, in comparison with King, where just about everything has been adapted into a feature film at this particular point, aside from, you know, like Insomnia and uh, Duma Key, you know, things of that nature. It seems like it's much more relegated, you know, in, in the realm of Barker in that particular regard. So as far as uh, just the tone of both of these guys, you know, I think that is one of the biggest things to really kind of compare and contrast in, in the fact that, so, you know, King is very much, I guess, kind of vanilla, you know, in that regard. He's, he, he's very much like of the semblance of Americana mm -hmm. and just the, you We're know. Very, very metaphorical. Good, good Wait. always winning out a lot of the mm -hmm. time and, you know, like the, the tried and true sort of approach and whatnot. Whereas I, I feel like there is a much more essence of darkness to Barker's work and, uh, you know, I mean, there's a scene in that book I wouldn't call vanilla. No. But, but, uh, very much, very much. But that's back when King was, you know, in his just, you know, strange sort of... But yeah, by comparison, in, generally. In, in, in it's, yeah. but, but at the same time, King is able to uh, achieve a level of, like, I don't know what the right necessarily term to describe it is, but... The you said Americana, I think, and yeah, I feel like he captures that a lot better mm -hmm. than than the Clive Barker movies. Granted, the Clive Barker stuff isn't really trying to capture yeah. that sort of thing. And also, Clive being British, you know. Yeah, you know, well, yeah, but I mean, it's uh, what I'm saying is there. I mean, I guess they're they're both strong at their own different mm -hmm. types of storytelling. Yeah. Um, it, even though they're both horror and both horror masters. They approach it in such different ways that I think it's it's really interesting that they don't overlap more than they do in in what they do and stuff like that. So I don't know. Well, and the interesting thing about both of their respective careers is that you know King, having become prevalent in the '70s, and then that quote that he put out there in the early '80s, he was like, "I have seen the new face of horror," and it's Clive Barker. So he essentially like anointed him as the heir apparent in a lot of ways, and. That's what, and they, they put it on all of those early releases of Clive's, you know, and that's what helped make his career. And then they went on to you well, know, they become give contemporaries and, you know, work together on various things and stuff. And so, mm. yeah. Yeah. But the tone, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool. It's, it's great that we have two such prominent creators that can pull off such different tones and both in the horror genre. Mm -hmm. like, it's really interesting to me. Yeah. Well, no, again, going back into just like on the distinct styles, uh, King goes goes more for the the psychological torment, versus Barker goes for the hypersexualized um, graphic mental visuals. That's that's one of the biggest and physical torment and physical torment as well. Obviously, yeah. Well, well, his, with his uh, Hellraiser stuff mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that, and his Harry Des Moines stuff, or Harry Des Moines, sorry, Des Moines. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's one one of the biggest differences. But I've always, again, I've I've, I've always gravitated towards Barker just because he ha always had that that unique um, unique brutality and basically how he would present his stories and his characters. Like no no characters were necessarily good nor evil. It was there were uh, basically an it's a and, lot of am am ambiguity. Ambiguity and like gray. yeah, there's like, a lot of anti heroes, but you're, they're still f fighting for that final good. Well, to me, the, the, one of the big differences is, like, Stephen King has some scary stuff in it, but it's never been the kind of thing that I have nightmares of. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the Cenobites and the way hell is represented in the second movie and a lot of that, like, that is stuff that stuck with me and when I was younger would, would keep me up at night because, Lord Almighty, I did not want to be captured by a Cenobite and tortured to the point of being turns to like pain and stuff like that. Like all that was a lot scarier than, than what Stephen King was presenting mm -hmm. me with in, in a majority of cases. I think that's why I'm not a big fan of puzzles. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Don't want to accidentally open any doors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get you. Yeah, but as far as like the depravity and so on and so forth, you know, in, in that regard, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, Clive most definitely has, a, has it in, uh, oh, in spades in comparison. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if we're going to talk about just like, I mean, even some of the stuff in the books of blood where there is 
I mean, everything from it gets to the point where sometimes sometimes it's just it's it's overly graphic. For, um, yeah, to, for, for the sake of being graphic, and, exactly. and, and we can even compare it to like you know Alex Garland's Men, which we have talked mm -hmm. about, and you know excessively recently, mm -hmm. and uh, just and how it's trying to push buttons for the sake of pushing buttons, as opposed to you know necessarily like being being a part of the narrative mm -hmm. and, and you know an important aspect. Mm -hmm. But again, it was it's it's how it was always delivered with that that nice little artistic touch, because mm -hmm. if it was just a blatant grotesque over sexualized I don't mm -hmm. feel he would have gotten near as far as he would have so, so as far as like adaptations then since the, I mean we primarily like just seen Barker stuff mm -hmm. obviously uh, and not read as much um, I don't know what is uh, one besides like the aforementioned Hellraiser that, that you guys really gravitate towards that you think was impressive I've always I've always loved Lord of, Lord of Illusions like, uh, yeah, Scott Bakula, like, he's always been my Harry Damore. <laughs> like, I don't care, you, can, you can't replace him with me. Um, no, that was, that's one of my most favorite stories. Just, and again, even going from the story aspect into the movie adaption, basically they're two, two completely different stories. Uh, aside from yeah, certain, the last illusion, I think is the name of the, the yeah, short. The short story, yep. yeah, yeah, from books of blood sex. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, like I was saying, like they're two different stories, but both are equally just as great on their own. I'm gonna say <clears throat> um, one that I didn't even know was Clive Barker when I first experienced it, because I guess I just must have missed the credit in the movie. But yeah, the Midnight Meat Train. Yeah, oh, yeah, the yeah. Bradley Cooper um, one is damn. Yeah, man. I mean that's early Bradley Cooper. It had you know the director who did Downrange and did. Yeah. Uh, um, no, he. Oh God, I'm gonna blank on it too now. Put yeah. me on the spot. He did Godzilla: Final Wars. Uh, but yeah, no, I like that because it was a good mystery. Uh, Bradley Cooper was very strong in the lead role, but it ultimately ended up being you know a monster movie mm -hmm. and. These, you know, extremely gory. Vinnie Jones was, was awesome yeah. as just the, you know, the dude with the mallet. And oh, yeah, yeah, silent and nasty, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, it was a fantastic movie and had a really great ending too. I, I liked that, you know, I like movies that go for that particularly dark ending where he mm -hmm. now is the new guy that yeah. has to take people out and stuff. So yeah. passing of the torch, so to speak. Yeah, I, I really right. dug that yeah. story. And then when I found out it was Barker, I was like, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, I really like Midnight Meat Train. Yeah, I was into the the Books of Blood adaptation, honestly, both of them, as a matter of fact, because they just did kind of like a soft reboot on Hulu a couple of years ago, which I thought was good. It had a couple original stories, and then it was a, also a, a readaptation of uh, you know one of the stories from the uh, the, the beginning, the, the first volume of Books mm -hmm. of Blood, mm -hmm. where there's almost like a uh, what's the best way to put it, where it, it's it's a kid who says that he can like communicate with the dead and hmm. he is like putting on some bullshit because he cannot and then in turn it's almost one of those situations where oh okay you are in fact gonna like feel the infliction of nastiness because you were tampering with those forces sort i of remember thing. that yeah, yeah i really liked good, that movie man. when i saw it i've only seen it once when it came out but yeah it's been adapted twice now but uh, yeah yeah the most recent bit was what was on hulu and then a few years before around the same time that they did uh dread which was another adaptation of uh of a short story from, from Books of Blood. So uh, as, as far as like, is there anything that you guys can think of uh, King-wise that is comparably shocking, you know, as, as some of Clive's more notorious work? I mean, maybe Pet Cemetery, maybe It, I suppose. I would, I would say between, uh, probably Pet Cemetery and It would be like the close contenders to just the, the nastiness mm -hmm. for, for what like Clive Barker would be bringing. But yeah. again, King, King was very, again, I, want, I don't necessarily want to say vanilla because he wasn't <laughs> like a vanilla writer. That was the writer. term that I threw out there. So I know. I'm guilty for it. You yeah, know? no, no, and you're it's good. It's just more so but because it, he's a little bit older and it's it's about, you know, he's very much more of like the, you know, tried and true American way, like mm -hmm. much more of like the virtuous, like Captain America type as opposed to, you know, the... Yeah, he's, know, well, he's kind of, uh, part, King's so. more on that like old school storyteller style. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean... <clears throat> Maybe, uh, honestly, the stuff that his son does is can is a lot darker. Would, would be <laughs> a closer to even Barker because yeah, it's a lot darker. Um, but I mean, for King, I don't. There's nothing really that I've watched of his um, an adaptation wise that that really has stuck with me um, the same way that the Barker stuff has. It's just. I mean, it's good for the most part, but I don't know. Some of it just it just doesn't 
land as shocking to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think King like has embraced more of like a camp factor, so to speak. You know, I mean, there's there's that old school EC Comics, you know, Tales from the Crypt, and mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you know, Vault of Horror and stuff like that, where you know, there's like a, a tongue in cheek sort of situation as opposed to where, whereas I feel like Barker's stuff is primarily very <coughs> serious mm-hmm. and takes itself. Well, very and the seriously. thing too with uh, Stephen King, like how he writes, there's a lot of uh, inner monologue and like inner detail that you can't get translated onto film as well as how Barker will present his, his situations. They're not, like, he, there's, the, there's the detail, but it's describing the, the room that we're in and like the, the clothing details like that. And it's not so much of like inner monologues of our characters on what they're thinking that can't be translated as well. Mm-hmm. So that's why I feel also is like the, Cl- the Clive Barker adaptions have always worked better. Okay. Well, and I think one of the bigger differences between the two of them as well is that whereas Clive has primarily stuck to horror, and granted I haven't read, like, because uh, I know he did a uh, like little segue into almost YA with, uh, you know, certain instances here and there. <coughs> but, you know, King has mastered the essence of drama as well, as opposed to being strictly horrific. Mm-hmm. Well, and so that's where stuff like The Body, which was made in The Stand By Me, and even Shawshank and, you know, things of that nature, mm-hmm. he's shown that it doesn't have to be just strictly scarific to have an essence of like you know powerful impact mm-hmm. and that's where Barker went into with like Weave World and the Great and Secret Show mm-hmm. um, those ones were more on <coughs> like a, like almost like a whimsical fantasy world I which think w- the Thief of Always is that the one that I'm thinking of where uh, it was him like kind of veering into a YA sort of situation I, I haven't be- read it yet I believe so yeah it sounds right yeah. <laughs> you're like sure why not <laughs> sure we'll just go with you with what you say <laughs> Yeah, I think it was Thief of Always. I'm just gonna I think, okay. please, please continue. I'm just gonna double check on that. But uh, but no, with this um, with yep, Thief of Always. Thief of Always. Okay. Yeah. So with Weave World and um, the Great and Seeker Show, so those were sequel novels for mm-hmm. each other, and that was more on it was a like a whimsical Pleasantville hmm. kind of aspect okay. that, he, that he did, but he tied in um, like magic and things like that that you typically don't get with like a lot of Barker stuff. Mm-hmm. Barker specializes in your your creatures, your monsters, your killers, things like that. Mm-hmm. So having this this branch out to see that he can write other st- other style stories and he's pretty good at it. I just would like to see more. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that third final book out of that series. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the thing. He's uh, he's not really done as much from like a, a written standpoint. Not in, in a while. In, in quite a His while, last one was, um, I believe, the Scarlet Gospels. Mm-hmm. Right over so, there, yep. uh, which we did review on the channel, and it was an interesting kind of amalgamation of the Harry Demore stuff and the, the Hellraiser mm-hmm. you know, storytelling. All the I love that. Book. Yeah, so if you if you do haven't haven't read that book, it's the check shit. that out. It's, it's so, so good. awesome. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I mean, we're talking about going into the depths of hell and all yeah. of the craziness entailed with that. You ever and, wanted to see Satan have a throwdown battle with Pinhead? Yeah, that's that's, it, 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 yeah, it, that's it, what it, Barker does, and it's it's, it's pretty it's metal. Pretty rad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and yet that's the thing is that I I feel like since he's got his hand in so many different you know proverbial cookie jars, I suppose you know because he's he's uh, co-scripted comic books, he mm-hmm. still writes plays, he still paints. I mean, I guess that was one of the main things that we really wanted to emphasize with this panel is the fact that you know whereas Steve has published so much more written work like. Clive is very much an everyman in the mm-hmm. fact that, I mean, he does so many different things and then and, and the coolness of, of his creative output, I suppose. Well, and he's he, been successful in so many different yeah. venues uh, mm-hmm. at this point. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so, so then I, Parker has the quality and the quantity. Not the same amount of quantity, but no, no, he has no, much no. quantity. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the biggest that, thing. That, that I won't ever argue. Like, <laughs> King, the, the, the amount of stuff that King has pumped out is mind-boggling. Yeah. yeah. yeah and uh, I mean, just put on a new short story this past week, yep. you know, mm-hmm. that's exclusively on script called Finn. So it's not great, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> um, it's a story? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So since we're, we're about halfway through, through the proceedings, for, uh, you know, proper and stuff. So... Who do you prefer, Cecil? I mean, as far as like you know, between the the, the creative outputs between these two guys, who who do you really find? I, I definitely gotta say I prefer Barker, just because it's. I mean, for all the reasons we've kind of mentioned, I I love creatures. King doesn't really do creatures that often, and when he does, they're usually in the form of something else for a great deal of the story before they become creatures. Yeah. Um, but um, the idea again, Barker made Hell uh, like a really 
I, I, when I think of hell, you know, the really scary version of it, it's not what I heard in, you know, my religious schools growing up. It's not what I've seen in certain, you know, like the supernatural version of hell or, or Bill and Ted's bogus journey version of hell. <clears throat> it's it's the, the Clive Barker version of hell that I feel would be probably based on what hell is supposed to be like that to me is is a pretty accurate representation mm -hmm. of it and so um it's just scarier to me and it's it's more you know saving your soul from damnation is a bit higher stakes than escaping from a rabid dog mm -hmm. in my opinion you know what i mean so yeah, yeah. it just a, a lot of it lands with me better than the stuff that the king does plus like you said King is largely drama with horror mixed in most times, whereas yeah. Barker is like a straight, you know, horror storyteller through and through from mm -hmm. beginning to end. So yeah, um, yeah. that's and more of my alley. Yeah, and if there's any criticism that I would have from Barker, then you know, is that often his characters aren't developed to the degree that, is, that, is that King's true. characters are. That is true. Know, the King's character very development. very much about characterization yes. mm -hmm. and, you know, almost to a fault because he overdoes it sometimes and it's mm -hmm. like, okay, I, I know enough about this person and he just goes and goes and goes. It's like, where's the editor sometimes? And to, I don't need you know, to real, know if he likes green shoes on Thursday or not. You know, like. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Robert? Um, I'm, I'm obviously, obviously going to have to go with Barker just because the, the, the detail in the storytelling has always resonated with me a lot more. I like the, the, the graphic nature that he presents. Again, King King is is good and good and good and all, but it just, <laughs> it's just it doesn't resonate with me as well as Barker does. And even as growing up, I, again, I started off with King before transferring over to Barker, but it's just one of those things that the the detail the 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 detail it just it, it hits me a lot better. And the creatures again, I'm more of a creature guy versus your your regular serial killers and crap like that. I like your supernatural things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's tough, man, you know, because as, as far as like a pure horror writer goes, I side with Barker, you know, mm. but I, I prefer Psy King because of the fact that he's written stuff like Pet Cemetery and mm -hmm. Stand and It and Salem's Lot, and I love the Dark Tower stuff as well, you know, at least the first four <coughs> books. And so for that reason, it's, it, I, I, in a lot of ways, feel like King is less of a horror writer and more of just like the great American author, and yet Barker is most definitely like, pure like through and through at least from the li the, the limited experience mm -hmm. that I have with him he, he feels like much more of a pure horror writer in comparison and so if I'm going to say as far as prolificness goes I mean King has a decade on him and you know it is what it is but as far as like just the the vast amount of different aspects of creativity between comic books between painting between you know writing plays between the, the, like assisting and designing of video games and lots of other stuff I mean I, I, I feel like Barker is a little bit more prolific, but just in his own way. As a writer, like specifically like just a pure writer, Psy King is most definitely, you know, he has the edge on him. But as far as like freaky, really messed up stuff, uh, I think Barker takes the cake in that regard. So, so I guess that's not really a, you know, proper response as to who I'm, I'm affiliating with. <laughs> but, um, Who the hell was yeah. Stephen King? Damn yeah. fence sitter. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. <laughs> Well, let's, let's real quick um, extend an invitation to anyone in the audience if they have an opinion or a preference. I would yeah, like or to question, hear it. In inquiry, anything, you know? What was your guys' first experience with either one of them? Start off with you. Uh, my brother, uh, I read reading uh, Stephen King all the time. I read books. I mm -hmm. oh, okay. yeah, not a single one. I've seen two of them. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. That's fun. But, um, yeah, I mean, recently, yeah, I've watched a lot of Clive Barker. Nice. Oh, yeah. 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 Heck yeah. Yeah, so, definitely a very unique, but, you know, I saw the new Pet Cemetery, and that was pretty creepy, too, but I saw the original one. Yeah. I like the new one, too. A lot of people hate on it for some reason, but. I had some issues with it, but, I mean, Mary Lambert's original is so good. Messed me up. So if you had a preference between the two, you would say. It's tough, right? I yeah, mean, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, by comparison for sure. <laughs> nice, awesome, okay. How about for you? Um, for, for both or for King? Well, yeah, how, yeah, how did you come across either and both, or both? I used to be, okay, it's so weird that when I was little, I was such a little pinky and I was afraid of everything. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm right there with you. I slept with a nightlight till I was like 12. So, yeah. No. Yes. yes. There you go. <laughs> ah, I love Jeffrey Combs. I remember when I was little, I saw, I think it was it on TV. And I immediately changed the channel. Red. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if it was on regular TV. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. all those edits and whatnot. I, remember, yeah. I couldn't stop watching that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to sleep in the living room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to be in any particular part of a room where uh, something in the in the wall can tell you to feed it blood. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. Just hawk the mattress out in the yard. <laughs> Do you have a preference between the two? Nice. There you go. Yeah. Right on. So we're all pretty much on the same page here. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think especially over time, you know, the, the, the fact that so many people don't often realize that King was behind the Shawshank Redemption, which mm -hmm. is one of the hundred greatest American movies of all time. Not just and, that, the, but the, the Green Mile. The AFI. Yeah. Green Mile's great. The Green well, Mile. You know, Hearts in Atlantis. Hearts in Atlantis is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's, there, there's all too often just, you know, he was the horror guy for so long, you know, Carrie and Shining and Pet Cemetery and stuff like that. But he he really differentiated himself, and that's where just the exploring of Barker's work and you know maybe getting along to Thief of Always and some of the stuff where he you know, kind of branches out from that strictly scarific. Mm -hmm. So, what do they have coming up for you? I know that. Um... So there's <clears throat> there, there's two different Barker projects that uh, and everybody should keep in mind. Um, so oh, there's yeah. there, there's two different Hellraisers. That, that they're working on. So there is an HBO Max series of Hellraiser, which from the best of our understanding, it's gonna be like an anthological sort of thing, almost like what they did with the comic book. So it's gonna be exploring the Hellraiser universe, but it's not gonna be like strictly about Pinhead. Mm -hmm. and then, but that does have a Pinhead in it, right? It's, as far it's as supposed we know. to, it's supposed mm -hmm. to. Okay. But uh, the, the one that's even more exciting, I think for me, is the new Hellraiser film, yeah. which David Bruckner who did the Night House? Which well, was they recently uh, they recently so. did test screenings for did they? for it, and they yeah. were the pretty positive reviews mm. for the test screening. So I'm looking forward to it. The Bruckner one is the one doing the um, androgynous pinhead, yes. right? Yes, yes. exactly. Yep. yep. Yeah. So that's that's the big difference that they're doing for the. So in the book, in the original Hellbound Heart, um, Pinhead actually was described with more feminine features mm -hmm. and. Um, people don't realize that it, you know, it's supposed to be kind of a sexless being, but mm -hmm. it's described as more of a, of a feminine uh, being in, in the book. And then it got changed to Pinhead as everyone knows him. And so like six months ago or whatever, six months, nine months ago, it was announced that they had um, hired a, a trans woman to play the part. Which makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Really and nice. it's actually like, she looks like, or I hesitate to guess what pronoun she goes by at this say, point. Don't, but don't, don't play the pronoun. Yeah, I know. But, but nonetheless, um, it looks like it's going to be a fantastic representation of the character and one that's closer to the original source material than we've gotten before. So mm -hmm. both projects are actually really exciting. The, the reason I'm excited about the HBO Max show is because what I've learned, so what I've been preparing actually over on our TikTok channel is I'm going through all Hellraiser comics that have ever been made. And there's 104 of them, 104 issues across, like, I think it was like 20 different series or something like that. Yeah, I was going to say, because Clive did <clears> some <throat> himself, but then there were others yeah. where he just mm -hmm. let other people yeah. just mm -hmm. go play in the, you know, proverbial. But what we found is, because um, we actually did a read-through of all the books um, associated with Hellraiser for, for reviews on the channel, and... <clears throat> I personally think that Hellraiser is the single best horror property to lend itself to anthological storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the multiple stories in one movie or multiple stories in one book because there's a litany of Cenobites out there. And, you know, not only that, but we found out in, in recent, in, in some of the later comic book stories that Clive wrote himself that there are, you know, different levels of hell with mm -hmm. different versions of Cenobites and yep. armies of Cenobites that sometimes fight with each other and yep. stuff like that. Yeah, very much a Dante sort of situation. Like there are <clears> levels <throat> of hell right. yep. and, you know, the kind of, you know, combativeness amongst them. Yeah, but, but that's the thing. Like, a lot, most of those Hellraiser comics are anthology books where every issue is like three different stories where 
a random person runs afoul of a, of a box and summons a Cenobite, a Cenobite and what happens from that point. So that's why I think the anthology HBO Max show will be fantastic because you're not bound to one person. Like the box can pass from person to person in between episodes and then you get a whole new, you know, cause, so you can have representation, your main characters for each new episode can represent a different viewer, you know, the, uh, you guys can be watching and be like, Episode three, you're like, oh, hey, that, that character's like me. Uh-oh. You know, and like episode five, you might be like, hey, that character's like me. Uh-oh. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah. it, and it can be a global thing, which I think is really cool because you can set those stories essentially anywhere in the exactly. world. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So well, I'm, any, I'm any, really any excited Any time about period, that. really, yeah. too. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Hell, even, too, um, we went through with a, uh, a Sherlock Holmes crossover with uh, the Cenobites. Yeah. yeah. Which was yeah. Um, fantastic. It's, yeah, it's called Sherlock Holmes and, and the, uh, the Servants, Servants of Hell. Of hell. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's, yeah, it basically... Not, this, not written by Barker, but... No, no like it's, it's written by... No, but it's, it's, by, it's written by Barker's essentially his mm-hmm. um, uh, Hellraiser historian, mm-hmm. the, way, right. the way Robin yeah. is yeah. Stephen King's historian. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, so he wrote it, and it's really cool. It's basically the original Hellraiser story if it was taking place during the time when Sherlock Holmes and Watson were around. Um, so it's got some of the same characters from the first book or first movie, oh, but yeah, it mentions it's, Moriarty. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, Moriarty mm-hmm. comes into it, and it's so it's Sherlock versus Pinhead. It's really freaking cool. Yeah. Well, actually, it's not Pinhead because it's... Oh, no, it was a version of Pinhead. Was, yeah, that's it's right. Yeah. yeah, it technically was. Yeah, because yeah, it, but it's set in, like, the 1800s or whatever mm-hmm. it was. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good one. Highly too. recommend reading that book. Yeah. yeah. Like, it, really, it was Holmes a pretty fun little read. of hell. Really good. So, what else we got, Fuego? Yeah, Are we nearing the end? Is that we, basically we, it? Yeah, I mean, we were planning for like 10 minutes of like audience, <laughs> audience interaction. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but, but as far as King stuff goes, um, you know, Firestarter just recently came out. Mm-hmm. And so uh, t- t- mixed response from a lot of people this, in this remake, unfortunately. And then in September, we finally have the first theatrical version of Salem's Lot, which is coming out because they were two different miniseries previously. There was the one from the 70s, and then there was the one on TNT with like Rob Lowe in the early 2000s. But it's the first time they're actually doing it as a theatrical release, so that comes out in September. And uh, so some excitement there. And then also in September, we have the newest book of his, which is called Fairy Tale. And it's apparently him veering back into like the, the fantasy, medieval y sort of stuff. like. It's, it, it seems like it has similar vibes to like the Talisman or uh, even maybe some Dark Tower connections possibly. But um, yeah, so he's got another like 700 plus page monster, which is about to be unleashed upon us. And oh so, my crap. yeah, man. <laughs> and you know, I'll devour it in like, in, you know, span of like two or three days probably. Oh, so, so. yeah. Yeah, give, right. give him forty-eight hours at most. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, and, and, I well, mean, we can wrap it up early. It's not a big deal. Yeah. No, to. I mean, we, well, I was hoping we could at least get, get get forty-five minutes, but um, yeah, yeah, we're okay. close to that. We're, we're about five forty. Minutes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I, I mean, questions, questions or like thoughts, just I mean, like pick that? our brains briefly. Anything of that coolness? I mean, don't feel pressure. Don't feel yeah. pressure. You don't. You can say if, no. <laughs> if, if if not, it's okay. We're just stoked that we actually had some in attendance for this because we weren't sure with like the last minute confirmation, and, you know, what the attendance was going to be like. So. Do you have a favorite Fred I I would have to say it's um, his Lord of Illusion stuff. Again, I, like Harry Harry Damore has always been one of my most favorite characters that he's written, and I wish we'd gotten more of him. Which is cool is like, even like on some of his like. Uh, the non-horror stuff, so even like Weave World and um, The Great and Secret Show, Harry makes a little appearance in there for a brief moment. But yeah, pre- predominantly he's between like the the Hellraiser stuff and then the Lord of Illusions stuff. But no, I would I would definitely have to say Lord of Illusions is one of my my top ones. But I I have a soft spot for uh, uh, Rawhead Rex though. I love Rawhead Rex. The movie is, is it doesn't, the movie's a little goofy. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't hold up. And but the, the problem with that though, and Clive has always he's, he's made no qualms about it, is a lot of studio interference from the Rawhead Rex stuff. That movie, like the, the, between the design, was nothing of what he originally wanted. So I would say I would like out of that, the, the story wise for Rawhead Rex is one of my more favorites. But movie for movie wise, it would be Lord of Illusions. You see, from what I understand, he got so mad about those adaptations of like Rawhead Rex, and then there was another '80s thing that he did. The, the title is eluding me, but um, that that's why he started directing his own yep. stuff because he was like, "Nope, they're, yeah. they're we'll just even take, it up." Well, and... even we'll, like take um, Candyman. 
mm-hmm. and everything. Like, what, yeah, which what, we didn't even really touch upon. Mm-hmm. And The Forbidden is a very, very solid short story. But that, that's one of the situations where I definitely felt like it, it, the source material was elevated with how mm-hmm. you know they, they decided. To put well, and that we've together. said that before too. Is like even like the like short stories in general between Stephen King or even Barker. It's a lot easier to adapt a short story because you can flesh out that universe a lot more, and you can you can expand on your characters. It's easier to expand versus taking an eight hundred page novel and condensing it into like an hour forty five. That's why I feel like again ninety percent of the King adaptions fail because he has so much detail in inner monologue with his characters. We can't translate that as well onto screen. Yeah. Versus well, what versus how, how how Barker writes his stuff. Which is why I think King works so much better in like a mini series or like a you know season sort of standpoint yep. as opposed to you know just having to condense it down into a feature. Agreed. Well, but look, I, I think a lot of that was because Hollywood limitations mm-hmm. or their self-imposed limitations, right? Because they would always try and squeeze King's book into one thing. But I think finally, <laughs> very little in this world can we thank. Twilight for um, <laughs> so between Twilight and uh, Harry Potter mad. though right the last book in the series had to be split into two different films in order to properly tell the story then we get the new version of it they had to split it into two different movies in order to properly tell the story I think they realize now that oh eh, maybe maybe the last so much, yeah, maybe yeah. the last 30 <laughs> years of the way we made Stephen King films wasn't the smartest way to do it <laughs> maybe uh-huh. we should do it this way and actually tell the story proper so I'm glad that that's finally been figured out, but um, yeah, it just took way too long for that to, to get figured out. Yeah, it's why I thought Lisey's story on Apple TV Plus was so good because of the fact that they, they took a novel that's around 500 pages and they gave it 10 episodes to really See, you yeah. know, flesh things out properly and they didn't have to omit you know, like very like key you know, mm-hmm. important sort of bits. Yeah, if you're able to take at least like three, like two to three chapters and put that in an episode and expand it out, that's going to work a lot better. You know, as far as a favorite Barker tale, so since I've been doing all of these books of blood reviews and uh, just kind of narrowing things down, I, I talked about this one on our YouTube channel previously, and it's called Son of Celluloid, and it's from the third volume of Books of Blood, and there is an escaped convict, and he ends up dying in the back of this theater, and he had a, a cancer spreading through his body after he was, you know, wounded. And uh, the cancer becomes like sentient, and it's like a weird blobby mess that is able to like I don't know some some workers at this theater are like entranced by this nastiness, and it's it's one of the weirdest shorts that I've read in recent memory. I, I talked about it. I almost certainly makes you think but, of a basket case. Yeah, little bits, little <laughs> bits. Yeah, but I, I mean sentient cancerous nastiness that's somehow able to like you know glimmer. And to uh, attack and chant and trance. Yeah, yeah, it's very strange. But if you uh, haven't done much of the literary stuff, <clears throat> I actually highly recommend the the Books of Blood on Audible. Oh, hell um, because <clears throat> excuse me, sorry guys, they're short, digestible stories. Mm-hmm. So whenever you're driving, you know you can take in one, or or over the course of you know your errands through the day, you can take in one. And there's some really interesting stuff in there. Nice. Um, I can't remember because I've only read the first books of blood um up to a point so i've only mm-hmm. actually read like the first four stories mm-hmm. but there was one in there that i was like really caught off guard by that was really cool wasn't there one where like there's a demon that keeps telling the guy or, like the guy tricks the demon essentially gathering jack yeah yeah yeah, oh, that yeah. Okay, yeah. i thought that was a really cool i was like D- these are really interesting stories so yeah. highly recommend that's a great way to take it in and it's mm-hmm. not buying into a thousand page novel like you would have to with like Stephen King or something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, and Books of Blood were the origin of, you know, Candyman for the Forbidden. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the Midnight Meat Train as well, the, mm-hmm. the, the title story, Books of Blood, and so yeah, I, I mean, they are interestingly di- digestible in their dire nastiness. <laughs> <you know? laughs> well, even like, was it uh, Twilight of the Towers, which is Barker's werewolf story, pretty mm-hmm. much. Oh, cool. Which is it was pretty neat. It's been a minute since I've read it and whatnot, but it was, mm-hmm. it was fun. Yeah, there was also Genesis for Rawhead Rex. I mean, yep. yeah, yeah, various others. Uh, you know, as I as I scroll through the little list, I've reread here. that damn story yeah. so many times. Yeah. What's cool <laughs> is as you go through it, you find yourself going like, "Why didn't they make a movie of this one yet?" Like, <laughs> no, I would love to see Son of Cellulite, but I mean, you would have to have some goopy practical, you know, nastiness for. That'd be a cron- that'd be a cron- creep show. Why don't they do it on Creep Show? It seems like that would fit mm-hmm. the, the the goopiness that we get in Creep Show now, mm-hmm. the new Creep Show reboot. Yeah, as far as grain free matter and you mm-hmm. know and stuff like that, yeah. but. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, like, they, they have similarities and they are contemporaries of each other because they're not actually that far off in age. I think there's only like, like eight or ten years between the two of them, you know. But Clive got started so much, you know, later. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I have an affinity for both of them. I, I still probably prefer Steve, you know, at the end of the day. But as far as like just the pure nastiness of the horrific, I mean... Clive has unsettled me significantly more, whereas, you know, Steve has endeared himself to me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to use the term like, it, like Steve's stuff feels like it has more heart to it. Well, but, it does, because the, but you, you I feel like it does. You can resonate you know? with more of King's character. I think there's a little bit writes. more of a sweetness with Steve, you know, yep. in, in comparison. <laughs> it's like you said, there's, there's a lot more thrills in the Barker stuff, but less character development, so mm -hmm. less for you to kind of latch on to in that way in his stories but yeah. you're too busy getting scared in his stories to latch on to any of that shit anyway yeah yeah and i mean <laughs> being raised like a reformed baptist christian by my parents and all that stuff i mean all of the buttons that clive pushes are much more significant in their mm -hmm. in their craziness you know compared to how you know how i was raised i, I, I suppose but um but yeah i mean we we hit all of our base points awesome. and um uh, yeah it, it was a fun discussion i uh i'm very happy we got to do this. I Indeed. mean, we'll see what attendance is like on Sunday. Thank but, you all uh, very much for yes, joining thank us. You, yes, thank you so much. Thank all of you guys on the on the YouTubes for watching us. We greatly appreciate it. Um, stay tuned. We do have another panel coming at you from this year's event where we're going to be talking about horror icons and whether or not they should get a legacy sequel like the Halloween 2018s of the world or a full reboot like the Candyman's of the world. Yes. Um, so let us, uh, let us bring that to you very soon. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Ladies, if you're around here on Sunday, we'd love to see you again at that panel. It's 4.30 Sunday. 4.30 yeah. on Sunday, yeah. indeed. So um, thank you very much for coming, though. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting the channel the way that you do. Until next time, though. Actually, you know what, Fuego? I'm sorry. I'll, I'll just leave it back over to you to close this one out. <laughs> Uh, a grande gracias, everybody. Thank you so very much. Those who were in attendance and those who are tuning in and seeing this on the YouTubies. And uh, until the Wheel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, sin amigos, constant readers and viewers alike, say thank you. Hoping we have been well met and we share more of this palaver sooner rather than later, whether it's about Psy King or Barker. And uh, until next time, remember to stay scared and read Stephen King and Clyde Barker. Give them their equal attention. They are both <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you.